It was such a tragic day, but it was a really a great day to see the American spirit rally up, right? There was no Democrat, there was no Republican, there was no conservative or liberal. It was all Americans fighting back, putting flags out there to say this country is not going down this way. We're going to go, we're going to go defend our freedoms all the way around the world. On the last episode of Blue Grit Podcast. And when I was at the basic school, one of the exercises was to call in Cobra gunships to blow up stuff. It's called the nine line brief. All the second you get the nine line brief. And I started fumbling on the radio, fumbling around. And this captain, this Cobra helicopter, goes, Lieutenant, where are you? I go, sir, I'm on Hill Alpha Bravo 101. I'll be right there. And he landed his Cobra right on top of my position, had his co pilot jump out, come over to me and go, This is you. This is a target. Just clear me hot. I'll take care of the rest. And he jumped back in and took off, and I was like, that was God himself. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be that guy. I put in for a package for Marine Helicopter Squadron 1. I was now a major. I had over 1,000 flight hours, all the right quals. And now it's, can I go and fly the president? And you have to put a package in and go before a board. Back. We'll get that place cleaned up. Cars, are, everybody's coming back to Andrews. Great. And as we're going down the schedule, all of a sudden somebody came running into the room and goes, hey, quick, turn on the TV set. Small plane just hit the, the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And you being Change. from New York, I'm sure. Well, everybody stop what you're doing. We turn the TV set on and we're looking at that iconic photo of a crystal clear blue day in Manhattan. And why would a pilot careen into a 110-story landmark when literally you got the Hudson River to your left or the East River to your right? And most of us could glide. If a plane lost its engine, you could reach LaGuardia. It's that close. And we it, knew. This you knew right then? It's going to be a different day. So my experience has no aviation in it, period. I walk up to the back door of the police station. Assistant chief sitting on the back porch, back steps of the, of the station there. And he goes, man, did you, did you hear some dumbass flew a plane into a building? And I said, what? And he said, yeah, the World Trade Center. And I said, like, just some redneck in a Cessna? And he goes, yeah, that's kind of what's saying, just a plane. And I'm like, that's crazy. Really cool assistant chief. He goes, I got a big TV in my office. You want to go in there and hide out and watch it? And I said, yeah. So we turned it on. It's smoking prior to the second plane. I have no aviation background at all, so I'm thinking, I'm just trying to process through, right. how does a dumbass not see that building in a Cessna and I'm kind of thinking, does you know, does like a Piper Cub or a Cessna make a hole in a building like that? You know, wouldn't it maybe just bounce off? Or I, I don't know. Well, then the second plane hit. Wow. Your background, your experience, it pops up. You're realizing that's not a redneck in a Cessna. We have a full blown terrorist event unfolding right before our eyes in the city of New York. Everybody then comes. The colonel comes in. He goes, "Everybody, stop what you're doing. Eyeballs on me." Stand by for a lot of White House designated missions because whenever we have a national tragedy, every government agency has got some role to play. They either they all want to get airlifted. And it doesn't matter whether you're energy, commerce, interior, DOD, FEMA, everybody wants to get to the site to do something that they're responsible for. So they asked the DOD, the Department of Defense, to airlift them. But if you call the White House and you go, hey, boss, this is FEMA. Federal Emergency Management Agency. I need to be there. I got 75 doctors. Got to be on the ground in New York. And the White House says, go. You become what we call one alpha one priority mission. We will push baby food out of the back of the next available C-17, C-5, C-130, C whatever we have in the inventory to get you where the White House wants you to be. Damn. So on that day, W's in Florida at the elementary school. Laura... Laura was on Capitol Hill and moved to the FBI headquarters by her Secret Service detail when this was unfolding. They wanted to keep her housed up there. Cheney's there with you. He's in the White House. He's in the West Wing, his West Wing office at the time. Same thing with Dr. Rice. She was in the West Wing. Dr. Rice is there. Sec, uh, Sec Def, Secretary of Defense is at the Pentagon. He's at the Pentagon. He's in his office right now, and uh, everybody now is starting to fire up the command centers. Over at the Pentagon, it's a national military command center. And over at the White House, usually things happen in the Situation Room, 
which is near the Oval Office. It's not a hardened facility. It's a it's a secure communications room where everything comes in, can be parsed out to where it needs to be and who needs to have it. So you guys are sitting there. He comes in and tells you, hey, stand by. You guys realize, good God, this day just went from pretty easy to not. Y'all watch the second plane hit? We all see the second plane. And that's it. And then as soon as that hit, everybody went to really uh, battle stations, if you will, for lack of a better term. We were now on the phone with the Pentagon. We were diverting every Air Force heavy lift airplane asset to go and park them over at Joint Base Andrews, 15 miles to the east, because we knew the White House wants all we got. Everything has got to go to New York City. Wow, man. Wow. So at, at, what, at what point did y'all start getting directions uh, from anybody at that point? Or was it just basically meetings until – kind of explain that process after that. As soon as they ended up – requesting the one alpha one priorities the government <clears throat> agencies are calling into airlift ops we're passing it up to the deputy white house chief of staff well as we're doing the one alpha ones getting planes diverted talking to the pentagon going let's stack everything out of the sky get it over at andrews get it on the ground an airplane overflew the white house which is prohibited airspace this jet was so large and loud we all froze right there somebody ran to the window and goes big white jet hard left hand turn hey, we got breaking news, fire and explosion at the Pentagon. Oh, that was the plane that hit the Pentagon? And it turns out it was not the plane. We were doing a large Air Force nuclear command and control exercise. We had parked one of our national level assets, an Air Force E-4B. I don't know if you've ever seen one. Yep. It's a 747 with a weird cone on top. Yep. It was part of the exercise. Similar to like an AWOX. Yes, it is similar to that. And... When the second tower was hit, unbeknownst to us, the Pentagon activated that air crew in that airplane and said, get to the president of the United States. If he wants to climb off Air Force One and climb on to this E-4B or what we call the National Airborne Ops Center, the doomsday plane, essentially it's a flying Pentagon, then those two 747s need to work out where they're going to make the switch. And when that plane took off, real world, laser line, Sarasota, Florida, it made a left-hand turn and flew right over the White House. They didn't care. It was a real-world military mission in progress. The vice president, not knowing what that was, or us, got picked up by his elbows by the Secret Service and now being evacuated underground. And that's Pentagon's being hit about that time? Same time. Pentagon just got struck. Um, vice President Cheney's getting pulled in, sucked down to the Piot. Yep. Dr. Rice, how'd you end up? getting pulled into that chain to go downstairs, just the, the your communication ability? Exactly right. And I was the guy on call taking care of the president. So when they, all of a sudden, the 945, right after that, they evacuated the White House, second time in history. First time is February of 1814, Dolly Madison running out the back door with a print of George Washington. British were burning down Washington, D.C. Here it is 187 years later. We're evacuating the White House. So that boss I worked for, that Air Force colonel, said, we're out of here. we got to go to the alternate site. And I grabbed him and said, I can't leave. President Bush is not coming back. Wherever they're going to take him today, he needs snipers, doctors, helicopters, phones. He needs the package. And he goes, then you go across the street, go underground, go into the PIOC, the President's Emergency Ops Center, the bunker, do logistics, and I'll catch up with you later. Good Lord. Yes, sir. <laughs> How fast did y'all close all airspace in our country? It happened at 1014. Uh, so about a half hour later, we just had the, the what we thought was a shoot down of Flight 93. The order went out. And then we found out we didn't shoot it down. Shanksville. In Shanksville, the plane was on the ground. Heroes. Talk Absolutely. about heroes. And, you know, we sometimes... We underestimate the American population sometimes because we're inundated with social media and the, the young people today are on their phones. They're not paying attention. They're gamers. They're, 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 not, they're not gritty enough. And yet 40 ordinary Americans boarded that plane in Newark, New Jersey, on their way to San Francisco. 40 ordinary Americans united themselves. Tom Burnett, Todd Beamer, after talking to loved ones, three planes, three targets, fought back hand-to-hand -hand with terrorists, and ultimately crashed that plane in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And that plane was headed to the capital? It was. It was heading to the capital. On 9-11, they wanted to hit our financial capital, 
Twin Towers, our military capital, Pentagon, and then a symbol of our democratic process, our freedoms, take out the dome on the U.S. Capitol. But it wasn't the military that saved us. It was ordinary Americans that rose up, fought back, saved us that day. And that that goes back to the resolve in the American spirit. We're going to crash either way. So you're going to crash on my terms, not yours. Amen. Absolutely right. Yep. I got to do a nighttime tour of the Capitol two or three weeks ago when I was up there. And the amount of history and and the amount of history that would have been lost in our – it's it's weird to walk through there at night. It's weird to know that plane went down by common every day. Ordinary Americans doing extraordinary things. Mm-hmm. Because I may not have been walking through that building three weeks ago if that if they hadn't have done that. Isn't that cool? It was really, you know, it was such a tragic day, but it was a really a great day to see the American spirit rally up, right? There was no Democrat. There was no Republican. There was no conservative or liberal. It was all Americans fighting back, putting flags out there to say this country is not going down this way. We're going to go, we're going to go defend our freedoms all the way around the world. And everyone got on board. As tragic as that day was, you look back and, and, and several days after the fact, you know, the, the, the pride of the American flag on the streets, on every TV station, it, it was unremarkable. And you, and, and you mentioned it, we weren't Democrat. We weren't. Nobody saw color. Nobody saw political party. The unity that this nation showed was just unbelievable. And I, I so wish we, we could maintain that. Of course, it's just... Sometimes it's not feasible, but it's just a uh, man. What a what a desperate time, really, for this country. Well, yeah. I'm watching both chambers, the House and the Senate. Yeah, the R's and the D's go stand united. I think it was the following day, and sing national anthem. Uh, they think they sing. Uh, God bless America. God bless America. Mm-hmm. Yep. On the steps of the Capitol. R's and D's. House and Senate. Yeah. It was incredible. Yeah, and you know we we high we hold our law enforcement to high esteem, but after 9-11, the world held our military and law enforcement to high esteem. Mm -hmm. You guys couldn't get enough applause going to and from ground zero, doing your job to protect people. I think people had a sense of our fragility, right? That we're not this this nation that can't be attacked. We're not, you know, we're surrounded by 3,000 miles of ocean on either side of us. We're not impenetrable. It just happened. People lost their lives. And now maybe we need to pause and reflect and thank those people yeah. that raise their right hand and, and do this for a living. Yeah. Going back to leadership again, you're standing in the PIOC with the Vice President of the United States of America, Dr. Condoleezza Rice, who I freaking love her to death, respect, admire, wish she would come out and run for something to help get our country back on the right direction. Bob Darling from Small Town America, a major at that point? I was a major. Do you, are you just in work mode, make decisions, if this, then that? Or do you ever realize, good God, I'm standing here with the vice president of the free world, Dr. Condoleezza Rice, probably one of the smartest women I've ever freaking watched, admired, and respected in the PIOC, in the world crisis, and I'm down here with – I'm in the ball game. I'm in the biggest ball game in the world. Hey, you know what? You don't lose situational awareness. You know you're around VIPs. You know you're around the National Security Advisor or the Vice President of the United States. But they're not asking you to pay attention to them. They're asking you to do your job. And what is your job? You compartmentalize to say, I need to move assets in defense of the president. I need to get on the phone and start doing things. And they expect no less. They stood behind you. They let the military members do their job. And the most vertical chain of command ever laid down complete horizontally. And you could have been a Lance Corporal in the Marine Corps. If you had something to say to the vice president or something to say to the president himself, get it out. What's on your mind? Wow. They just, they're so humble and so professional. When you talk about leadership is knowing that there's a time and a place for a chain of command to make sure information is passed correctly. And there's another time and a place where time is not on your side and information needs to be shared ASAP. And if you're the guy with the information, give it to him directly. And I was amazed that I'm having conversations with the vice president directly. I'm asking Dr. Rice to go and 
passed this information to him when he's in the other room, and she's running like a courier on our behalf. The National Security Advisor is doing anything we needed her to do. She was humble, she was professional, and she was like, just keep doing what you're doing, and I'm here to help if you need me. You want me to interject my, my horsepower? You, you, need, you need my help to get something done? I'm here for you. If not, run with it. Incredible. It's cool. There were some crazy decisions that had to be made that day, shutting down all national air, grounding every plane over the United States of America. Um, the decision that if 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 people aren't going to, I guess, squawk, if they're, if they're not going to communicate and they're in the air, we're going to have to start taking down yeah. aircraft out of the sky, attacking American aircraft, um, messaging, getting the president home. Is that a fluid deal? Is that – there's – none of that has ever occurred in our lifetime. How – Are those happening just one after another? Is it a committee? Is it just, hey, let's roll with that? It's never happened before. We've never, we've had ground stops in airspace. We've shut down sections of airspace for one reason or another, emergency in progress. We never closed the airspace over the United States ever. And watching the Secretary of Transportation, who was in the bunker, Norman Mineta, get tapped on the shoulder by the vice president going, I need this to happen, do it now calling over to the Herndon, Virginia Command Center to order the skies over the United States clear. The people on the other end saying, Mr. Secretary, we are not properly manned to land 2,000 aircraft at the same time. And then to hear on the military radios, NORAD, the North American Aero Defense Command, jump on the network and go, we're in charge. We're taking, we're assuming control over the airspace of the United States. And the FAA seamlessly went to be a subordinate agency to the United States Air Force, NORAD, to help sequence 2,000 airliners and get them on the ground without mishap. Damn. From the time the call's made, and this you may not have this detail, from the time the call's made of we're going to clear the sky over the United States of America, how long before that relatively there was an all clear? That took about... 45 minutes, I would think, from my perspective. That's not long. To get every aircraft down. You know what else is impressive? Any oh, given, that's not long. Any given hour, this big country of ours has got 100 medevac flights in progress. People who have been shot, car accidents, snake bite victims, organs going A to B. And if we're going to clear the skies, you're going to order that helicopter down in a farmer's field. And through the coordination of the FAA and NORAD and the EMS people and those pilots, We gave every one of them that was in progress a military call sign, a brand new transponder code, and we treated them like they were U.S. military flights to get every patient or organ to a hospital. Wow. That's pretty impressive. Yes. I mean, that's – so my dad works – before he passed, he was was working for Southwest Airlines, and so I'm familiar with how difficult that is. That's not an easy task. No. And, you know, we didn't run off one runway. We didn't lose one person to a diabetic coma. We didn't blow over a Cessna by a large plane. We didn't have any aviation, air, or ground mishaps. mishaps. Yeah. First time in history we cleared the skies without a single mishap. You're standing in the room that day, and the discussion turns to shooting aircraft out of the sky as a last resort, God forbid, last resort. What was that like listening to and processing the, the input needing to be made that if we shoot down an American airliner, I don't know, was there 270 probably citizens on a American airliner? Up At to. At least 140. Yeah. yeah, up to on average, right? If it's a full aircraft, could have 300 people on there or, or, you know, some as little as 40, like Flight 93 had 40. But that was a defining moment when they went to, we got a, a potential hijacked aircraft heading towards Washington, D.C. And they moved from information to operations, and they said, get me fighters, get them out of Otis Air National Guard Base, let me know when when they're airborne, stand by to shoot this aircraft down. It was like, get in the game. It's time to stop wondering what's going on, and it's time to start taking action to defend America. And you could see the civilians and the staffers who were in the PIOC moved out of the way 
They got against the wall. It was a military mission in progress. And the vice president talking to me, who's talking to the Pentagon, and we're ordering these fighters airborne, and everybody else was just out of the way going, I can't believe I'm watching this happen. And, and that shift is, okay, we're reactive. We got, we got, they sucker punched us. But by God, now we get off defense. Now we get on offense. We're going on offense. And Vice President Cheney, and I don't know if I ever expressed this enough, his wife wasn't sitting, who was also there. She wasn't in the other room at the executive conference table. She was two inches away from him, making sure he was mentally in the game. He knew the enormity of those decisions. I'm going to take lives out of the sky to save people on the ground. And his wife was like, do your job. Keep doing your job. You know what the right thing to do is. And literally saying. Golly, man, that almost makes me. I don't know if I got chill bumps or cry. That power couple. And I'm watching her make sure he's okay mentally and physically and to keep going forward. Really incredible. And that's, that's literally, you know, there's a cliche, the, that decision's all that got the weight of the world on it, or that, mm-hmm. de- that literally, that's literally, yeah. yeah, you're going to kill Americans. You're about to have to make a decision to kill Americans. Yeah. And seeing your <clears throat> wife, his wife going, you're okay. Keep going. So the Don't. irony in this is, is, is several days ago, me and Clint were on the phone talking about some different things about different associations. And, uh, I think it's man of honor and they're on the ship and they're in a submarine. And one of the most iconic scenes of that movie is when, there's 20 sailors stuck in the bottom of this vessel in the very bottom. And they had been, I think had been shot by a missile or torpedo. And the captain looks down at that sailor and he said, seal that hatch, seal that hatch. Well, you know, and I know that by sealing that hatch, he's killing 20 of that guy's brothers. Yeah. But if he doesn't, they're going to end the mission and the whole ship goes down. And it was time to seal that hatch. Just like Cheney did that day. Yeah, and, you know, I go back. It's a great point, and I go back to what you, you always talk about leadership. People get promoted, and sometimes they don't understand the enormity of the position they've just been promoted into yeah. because it's great. You get a couple stars in the collar, right? You get the, you get the rank. You know, you're, you're the, uh, the commodore or you're the, you're the captain or, or whatever, the commissioner. And then at some point when things start going bad, and they look to you, are you ready? Yeah. Did you mentally transition from peacetime operations to wartime operations? And are you capable of making that transition to make that tough call? Yeah. Many aren't, but a few are. And we hope that training that we all undergo, and when the test of time comes to your doorstep, we hope that you know, you're the right guy who has the courage to make that tough call. And what a blessing what a blessing for you to be exposed there. Thank God you were there to help provide input that they needed. But I thank God that Dr. Rice and Cheney were in there that day because they're, and I'm not taking a shot at today's administration, there's been bad administrations in the past. Um, they were the right people at the right time, and uh, indecisiveness is the worst thing that a leadership can have, that a leader can have or not, not possess is decisiveness. My biggest pet peeve in the world is paralysis by analysis. Just make it a shit. I'd rather you make a bad decision than just not make a freaking decision. And love them or not, and I know there's a lot of people that have whatever they would like to say about um, Honorable Vice President Cheney, and I love Dr. Rice, but you're talking about very intelligent. Insti- they have a ton of institutional knowledge about what it needs to make those type level of decisions. And two people with ginormous brass huevos, let's, let's, we got to make calls. Let's start making calls. And you may not like them or their politics. You can, whatever it is. But thank God those two people were in there that day. Yeah. It was Vice President Cheney's greatest moment in America for all of us. He was the right guy. He was a, he was a congressman from Wyoming a chief of staff for President Ford, a secretary of defense for the first President Bush, now vice president. He wrote those war plans. He had the experience we needed that day to get America moving forward. It was truly his greatest moment. We would have followed him up the highest hill. Right and he had the different. persona. He had kind of that old Pat persona of, I'll make a call, charge the mountain. I mean, it was a, mm-hmm. uh, should we charge the mountain? His decisions, I mean, you feel like yeah. when he makes the call, Friggin', we're making the call. Let's roll. 
Yeah, and it wasn't, and it wasn't effort, effortless, effortlessly done. He, he, he had to weigh the enormity of that call, and he still had the courage to make the call. Same thing with Dr. Rice. She was right there supporting him, supporting us. She was the powerhouse that we all needed to be able to do our job with authority. And without that combination of Dr. Rice and Vice President Cheney, I don't know how the day would have unfolded. I really don't know what would have happened. I love powerhouse because it's a great – I've always tried to figure out what I would describe her as powerhouse. It's probably – I'm like, man, that's one person. I wouldn't want to debate her. I wouldn't want to – she would she would be sweet as can be playing the piano. If you guys have never looked at Doctor Connolly's rights, she's freaking amazing. But I thought, man, I, I wouldn't want to mess with her. Uh, she's, no. you know, and our country needs her now, like so bad. Yes, you know, you were mentioning the, the, the political divide and and just how bad things have gotten. There were good people like Doctor Rice won't run for office because it's not about moving America forward. It's now about what dirt can we find on yeah, Dr. Yeah. Rice and how can we talk badly about her, you know, in the press and bring her down and, and silliness that they're like, oh, I'm just not up for that. Or are you going to go look at my family history and find something wrong with me? Yeah. If you, if you're interested in me contributing with my experience and knowledge to move the country forward, maybe I would run for president. Was that a, you personally, so are we well, Doctor Rice. Okay, then no. me, then me, then you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if yeah. we're going to turn this into. And red. if you're out there, Doctor Rice, I'm willing to be your vice president. <laughs> <laughs> we called it here, blue green. I would beg her to. I think it's too toxic. She's like, well, why would I dabble? It's would, just purely yeah. toxic. Now there's nothing yeah. to be accomplished because it's just a Jerry Springer episode. Yep. Love her to death. Back to fire alarms too. Yeah, what was up with the fire alarm? Did I don't you see know. that on the news? The oh yeah. Come on. I don't I don't get that. What's happening? Yeah. Yep. When it's come down to that in America, times are changing. But you know, getting back to this this crew, getting back to you and Clint, um, I'm really proud of what we do for our law enforcement. I'm really proud of the fact that now this 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 titanium blue line is being respected uh, more so than even pre COVID, right? Everybody wanted to fund the police. And now they realize the repercussions of that. Yeah. And now everybody's like, will you guys come back? Will you, will, <laughs> if I throw money at you, will you, will you clean up my city? And it's like, oh, I guess you thought we were just eating donuts and yep. uh, not really doing anything. And now you see what happens at the repercussions of not having law enforcement keep tabs on the criminals that are, are destroying San Francisco. They're destroying Columbus, Ohio. They're, they're Austin, just, Texas. Austin, Texas. They're yep. running amok. And yep. now we can't, we can't get our law enforcement to do enough. The experiment failed. Mm -hmm. The experiment failed. And it's continuing, too, with Harris County, Bear County, Dallas County, Travis County. Uh, and what's crazy is that some of these, I mean, most of these cities that, are, that that you see the crime increase is being funded by a guy in California, which that's a whole separate uh, topic. But, yeah, I think we're on the bounce back now. I think people have, have, have woke up, no pun intended, about the realization of not, not, not really funding police departments and not having, you know, police departments' backs. And it's, a, it's affecting their... Uh, their citizens and their and their communities within there, the politicians at hand. So, you know, I just came from Tucson sector. I was telling Clint this earlier, and I got a brief by the border patrol agent from Tucson sector, oh. who were saying, "Hey, our hands are tied. Everybody is now working seven days a week. We gather up everybody that walks across the border. We process them, and then the DAs say, let them go. They get a court date ten years from now." to get a hearing on whether they should be here or not. They're gone. They're, they're, they're now, they're lost in our system. They're walking around. God only knows what they're up to, where they're going and why they're going there. And we lose tabs on them. And they're, not, and they're not Hispanics coming across. No. They're OTMs. Yeah, they're other than Mexicans them. coming across. I heard this the other day that the, uh, speaking of 9-11, that our, now our federal air marshals, did you guys hear about this? Our federal air marshals are now being deployed to our nation's border to process Illegal immigrants com coming across. Because that's an air marshal's exactly. job that's description. Right. Because now the current administration realizes, man, I think we screwed up. We should have maybe had a tidy on this. And now federal air marshals who are supposed to be in charge and in, in securing our, our, you know, our, sky, our eyes in the sky are now having to process illegal immigrants. And uh, who is the uh, Secretary of Defense now? Or I'm sorry, the Department of Defense. Uh, Secretary Austin? No. Uh, the the so, yeah, yes. He has now transitioned over into an app. 20 seconds is what you can process an illegal immigrant coming across our country. 20 seconds. 
And what's going to happen, right? We're going to have, unfortunately, we're, we're teeing ourselves up for another tragedy. Yep, 100%. And then we're going to go into react mode. And we're, we're going to say, where were you guys? How'd you let it happen? What's, you know, the cause of this? What, what could we do? And, and these folks are now over, they're flooding our prisons. They're overwhelming our systems. Yeah. They, and uh, I just don't know how we reverse this or how we can change to keep the population that's counting on us safe. Yeah. yeah. Is um, it's, it's going to get away from us. Something has to change. Yeah. Yep. Well, brother, uh, <clears throat> is there anything else we missed out on? Yeah, I want to hit real quick. Okay. Small town, rural world, New York, goes on to do all that you've accomplished. There's a vacuum in law enforcement of leadership, true, strong leadership, and I guess kind of hit it on twofold. What are some traits? What What would you tell a vacuum? If you're, if you're standing in the audience, your audience is 300 police chiefs out here. What would you share with them about helping get law enforcement back on the right track? And most of them are in it for politics, not to lead men and women in law enforcement. And we talk about on here a lot about you don't have to have a title to be a leader. I mean, in the Marine Corps, Lance Corporal and the squad's got a couple of people under him. I mean, they're, they're leading. We have a lot of young listeners. We have police explorers that are still in high school what would Bob, what would Lieutenant Colonel share twofold with 15, 16 year old kid out there that wants to think, damn, I'd like to lead something someday. I would like to be in a mix and make a difference in our country. And what would you tell the 55 year old chief that's more worried about politics right now than actually trying to take care of the men and women that a 300 man agency is expecting him to lead? What are some, what are some thoughts on that? You know, I have the honor, really, of speaking to the FBI National Academy, those classes of sheriffs, yeah. police chiefs, and I get to do about four times a year. And my message to them is, you got to stop and breathe, and you got to train. Leadership is not an end state. You just don't all of a sudden become a leader, and you're good to go. It's an endless journey of learning and challenging and doing and passing on to others your experience, your knowledge, giving other people a chance to actually get in the trenches and and see what it's like to make those decisions in in times of crisis. You got to train. You got to stop. You got to carve out some time, and you've got to start growing your next generation behind you. Your period is going to come to an end. You're the chief. You got a few years left. Then what? How well have you prepared the workforce proactively to replace you? And the only way to do that is to bring an expert. Take time to learn from others, do a couple tabletop exercises, send somebody to that class, have them come back to brief everybody else on what they learn. You have to make leadership a part of the job. It be can't, intentional. It be intentional about it. It can't just be what we do here is we protect and serve and, and we all go out right. and do it. you got to take time to grow and, and to kind of enhance your workforce. If you don't do that, there's going to be a, a deeper and deeper chasm, a vacuum, because the senior people will leave and the junior people that now become middle managers and seniors never had the opportunity to get hands on. It's funny you said that about a year ago, I'm talking to a chief and he goes, yeah, I'm, I'm about to punch out of here. I'm about to pop smoke. I said, oh, that's cool. I said, you got somebody in mind. He goes, no, nah, I got four assistant chiefs and they're none of them. None of those idiots are can take over. And he was really boastful to me about that. And I could tell he thought highly of himself and that it spoke well that they are not remotely what, who he is and what he is. And finally, uh, my discretion left me, and I told him, that's not really a reflection on them, yeah. negative. That's a reflection on you. Because if they've been your assistant chiefs for a period of years, you should be on the phone telling me, I have so damn many guys here that could take my job tomorrow or women here that could take me. I can if I get ran over by a bus tonight. I got four people. My four assistant chiefs will all fist fight because every one of them are badasses, and they could all take over. And of course, he didn't appreciate that. But I'm thinking, man, you're taking pot shots at your people like you've done something well, and you failed them. If you don't have at least one out of four, and you're bragging none of them like they're all idiots, and to the point you just made out, it dawned on me. I'm thinking. You should be grooming those guys. You yep. should, and if they don't replace you, that let them go replace somewhere else. What a greater honor! I hate Alabama, 
But if in, in Bill and I'm not a Bill Belichick fan, but regardless, freaking half the college coaches started at, under him at Alabama. Half the NFL coaches started under Belichick, and uh, whether you like them or not, those guys are are leader builders and mentors and. They, they're growing leaders like crazy. And, well, and, what, and what's even more crazy is the fact that those police chiefs typically have had a respectable career where they've actually moved up in the chains and they've they've got some kind of education. Look at the sheriffs in Texas. I mean, I worked for a sheriff that had no business in leadership, uh, and I'm thankful that I'm here at TMPA now. But, I mean, that the arrogance and uh, that some of these leaders have in law enforcement within Texas, it's scary. I tell you, the greatest leader I've ever known, when I was the first lieutenant in the squadron, he was a squadron commander. His name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ken Hill. I was fortunate enough, to your point, right, that we need leaders to, to groom. I was fortunate enough to be a, a pilot in that squadron. He, he briefed. We were doing a night vision goggle mission with six Cobras on goggles, carrying ordnance, going to hit a target to get back home. And I'm just one of the newbies. I'm First Lieutenant Bob, backbenching this whole thing. <laughs> and at the end of that mission brief, he stood up and he goes, First Lieutenant Darling, I sure hope you were paying attention. You got the lead. And I ended up getting in his aircraft, and I had to run the entire division on night vision goggles. And On I, that mission? On that mission. And I struggled, and I failed, and I made a mistake, and, and all these things. And he watched my back. But what he taught me in the three hours was, wow, we're all part of this mission. And on any given day, any one of us could be asked to lead. Wow. And, uh, man, I was sweaty when we got back. But, man, I learned so much from that guy. I never forgot the fact he put me on the spot. And I, uh, now I really pay attention because any one of us can be called yeah. at any given time. 100%. Well, and what a great way to do it rather than making it seem like he's punking you out or yeah, step up, rookie. It was, hey, man, let's see what you got. Let's learn from this. and. I, I tell everybody all the time, and, and sometimes my family doesn't appreciate it, but I'm like, I don't fail. I learn. I'd rather look at it as I learn because I fail a lot. I fall forward a more than I would ever want to, but it's the trial and error. It's the it's the full bird throwing you in the hot seat and letting you fumble yeah. through it and work through it. And Yeah, and the idea isn't to let me fail. It's to let me lead, right? And then he's got my back. He's got my left and right limits. He's going to make sure that we, we get through this okay and uh, make me successful. And that's the key, is not to put somebody on the spot to watch them fail, but to put them on the spot to watch them grow. But I think the current failures of the current law enforcement leadership, those that are out there, because we do have some phenomenal leaders within law enforcement, and I'm, I'm out, me and Claire both are in agreement and you. But I think the failures of today's law enforcement, those that, that are failing, is the intimidation factor, right? I think that the ones that the, 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 the failed leaders that are intimidated by their, by their subordinates of taking their position, they view it differently than what you just said. It's a threat. It's a threat, 100%. And, or that they're not getting the spotlight that they deserve, you know. Um, but, you know. Yeah, I don't want to highlight you because right. you know, it's a threat <laughs> or it might make you look good and not me. Yeah. Exactly right. And, you know, you get a lot of lip service on what servant leadership is or transformational leadership, but do we practice it? Right. Do we have the time to practice it? And, unfortunately, I think um, they say no budget, no time. doesn't yeah. happen. And then we're wondering why the Peter principle took off and, and this person yeah. is now in charge. So the 22-year-old 20, kids sitting out there, I, no, 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 I'll ch scratch that. What would – what would I know? You're 42 years old now. Yeah, and I've been moisturizing like a big dog. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God, Ulta. Mm -hmm. What would 42 year old Bob Darling tell 16 year old Bob Darling, 10th grader at small town New York high school? What would you tell Bob Darling now? Wow, that's a great question. I would say you know it's time to grow up, kind of mature. It's, it's stop doing childish things and start getting, it's never too early to get in the game. Read a book, get around people who don't, you're not threatened by, but you're willing to learn by because the world is coming at you pretty fast. I felt like I stayed a child too long and it wasn't until I was halfway through college and all of a sudden I was like, wow, I'm, you know, I got mediocre grades and life's coming at me and I, I'm lucky to have the Marine Corps as an opportunity for, for me to go and catch up and grow. 
I would like to take that 16 year old and say, it's, it's today. Today's the day mentally, physically, emotionally, you're going to get around people that are going to groom you for success. So you're not behind the eight ball when the day comes and it's time for you to make that choice. Great I love that. Yeah, I do too. I love it. Well, I think that, that's probably a good, good one to end on. <laughs> what do we not hit? Anything? No, you guys have been, I mean, what an honor really yeah. for me. Oh, yeah. Books. Oh, yeah. It's 24 hours inside the president's. Well, no, uh, Clint was nice enough to have me here. Obviously, Clint and I are friends. Tyler and I are buds. And the fact that they are, are talking about leadership and anybody who wants an opportunity to read about my story in this book, I, I capture my time flying Cobra helicopters and obviously my time in the White House bunker yep. on 9-11. You can check it out there in the bio and the link, and we're going to pop something up. Where's it going to be at, Clint? The link. Probably up here. If you're in the Air Force, it has big words in it. If you're in the <laughs> Army, it has fine print in it. Yeah. If you're in the Marines, it's got pictures. I got pop ups. Yeah. Come right out. He's oh, got yeah. pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, I appreciate you coming on, man. It's good seeing you again. Haven't seen you since the last Irving conference. I think it's when the last time we saw him. Uh, but, man, it's always a pleasure. Uh, Tyler, thank you very much. Absolutely. Pleasure being with you as yeah. well. Clint. You know, great to see you. And my wife actually found out you were going to be here today, and she was pretty, uh, pretty bummed that she couldn't come by here. So I'm not sure who's the bigger fan, me really? or her. So really? your stunning looks and your uh, charismatic ways. Well, you told me this morning I have a face for radio. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. That was Clint. <laughs> that was 100 percent Clint. So what's the future hold for Bob? Where, where, what's going on with Bob? Yeah, I'm still on my mission. Right, my mission ever since 9/11 is to build resilience. I got a, a small company called Flash Emergency Management. And I write business continuity plans. I do tabletop exercises I get with organizations to kind of prepare them for the coming crisis. So when it happens, they have all the tools they need to be resilient and get through it. Cool. Cool. I cannot. I've been waiting on this for a while. Cannot thank you enough for coming in and gracing us with this. And um, always damn good to see you. you we got to ask him the questions. Rapid fire. But maybe twist up. What's his favorite uh, chopper? Wow. That's easy. That's easy. Uh, so we always end each episode by asking three rapid fire questions. One is, uh, what's your favorite law enforcement movie or, or cop movie or line from a cop movie? You know, you right, right off the top of that, I have to do. Uh, I was telling my wife about this too. I saw the villain last night. Guy reminded me of um, Bruce Willis and the, the Burning Towers and stuff like that. Oh, um, McCain, John McCain. Yep. Yep. That's John your favorite, yeah, that's your he, favorite yeah, one? Yeah, came to mind. Yep. What is your Christmas favorite? Movie, so we usually ask, what's your favorite cop car? Uh, but since you've never driven up a cop car, what was your favorite uh, aircraft to fly when you were in the service? Obviously, the Cobra was unbelievable, right? It's like a Corvette. Yeah. Two pilots, all the bullets you can carry. But flying the big CH-53 Echo, seven-bladed, 50-passenger thing, I mean, it'll pick up your house. It's, it's pretty. And it's like a couch up front, too. It's like really comfortable and fast and powerful. But then again, you go into the uh, to the white tops, and you know, you, yeah. they're, they're pretty sweet too. I mean, so I, it's hard to pick a favorite. Let's go back to Cobras. If you were to if you were to pick a patrol car, which one would you say that's your favorite, or you think is the best? Yeah, I saw a couple Chargers out there that looked pretty. That looked, looked pretty, pretty good. Yeah, I saw, and, and a state trooper now went by me yesterday, but he was in an SUV. Yeah, you guys, Tahoe. You guys got the Tahoe SUVs. So yeah. they, look, they look pretty good. They look, out they there look pretty. They do look pretty good. And what's your favorite drink of choice? You like to relax and cut loose. Yeah, it's not Bud Light. It's, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm a beer drinker, yeah. right? So, uh, you know, I, I I go to Stella, I like Modelo, I like Miller Light. You know, I like that. if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna pull a drink off the shelf, you know, there's these things called mules. Have you ever had a mule? Yeah. Yep. Those are my oh, wife great. makes the best mule. Moscow mule, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Well, cool. You got anything else? No, I know you burn up the, the air miles. Please stay safe. Holler when you're in Texas. Holler when you're not in Texas. If we can ever do anything to support you, please. Yep, yep 100%. Well, thanks very much. And you're, same thing, when you're up in D.C., let me know. I will. I'd like to see you both again. Yeah, cool. Would love it. You guys stay safe out there. Uh, again, it's back in the winter months. It's starting to become, you know, that's kind of the increase of violence against law enforcement for whatever reason. Uh, God bless you. And as always, may God, God bless, bless Texas. Texas.